Hello, I'm Mark O'Shea and welcome to my study. This is where I write my books, do my research and examine museum specimens. I've had a passion for one group of animals since I was a small boy and now I want to introduce you to the fascinating world of snakes. This presentation is divided into two halves and I put some little quiz questions in there which you have to get right to be able to progress to the next slide. Part one we're going to look at what are snakes, where are snakes found, how big do snakes get, how do snakes move around and what do snakes eat. Herpetology. Herpetology is the study of Everything from frogs the size of your thumbnail to man-eating giant crocodiles. In other words, all reptiles and amphibians. And that's a huge number of species. Let's just look first at the amphibians. There are over 8,000 of them. Over 7,000 are frogs and toads. 753 are newts and salamanders, the tailed amphibians. And then, you might not have come across them, 214 Sicilians. These are legless amphibians that look very much like earthworms. But don't worry, you haven't found them in your garden, they're only in the tropics. And reptiles. Over 11 thousand species of living reptiles. I'm not even counting dinosaurs. Most of them are either lizards or snakes. Nearly 7,000 lizards, nearly 4,000 snakes. 26 species of crocodilians, including alligators. Almost 200 amphisbenians, which are legless, uh, and a legless advance on lizards. They're also primarily in the tropics, 359 turtles and tortoises, and one tuatara, a very strange beastie that's only found in New Zealand. So, altogether, that's an awful lot of animals that fall under the banner of herpetology. And you'll find that most herpetologists have their specialist areas. Some only work on frogs, some only work on crocs, some only work on turtles. Now, I've worked on most of these groups, but my primary interest is, and always has been, the snakes. So first, I want to do a little bit of myth-busting. Snakes are not slimy like a bar of soap. They look shiny, and people think, well, they must be like worms then, moving on a layer of slime. No, they're not. Their scales are keratin, they're very, very similar to your own fingernails, which, if you look at them, also glisten. Snakes are not slimy. They are dry. They are beautiful to the touch. Some ladies say that they feel silky. They're very subtle creatures. The snake's tongue is not a sting. Okay, it's in its mouth. Where the business end is, the fangs, if it's a venomous snake. But all snakes have forked tongues, even the non-venomous ones. And some lizards, monitor lizards and others, have forked tongues. The tongue is not a sting. It's not related to venom or poison at all. It's a sense organ. It picks up particles from the atmosphere. If it flicks out and it's trailing its prey, it is picking up the scent of its prey. If it's a male following a female, it's picking up the scent of the female. On the tongue, it goes back into the mouth, into an organ in the roof of the mouth called Jacobson's organ. And here it analyzes all the data. Jacobson's organ is what's known as an olfactory gland. And this is basically tasting and smelling. And it is the primary sense of all snakes, not just venomous ones. Totally harmless. And snakes do not hypnotise their prey. It's true they stare. They have no option. They have no eyelids. It's very difficult to blink if you don't have eyelids. 
Snakes are thought to evolve from lizards and if you look at a number of different groups of lizards you will see that some of the species that are more semifossorial, that live in the leaf litter or in the subsoil, they've actually lost their eyelids too and their eyes are covered by what looks like a transparent window. Think of a contact lens and you'll get the idea. It's called a brill or a spectacle and it enables a snake to see out or the legless or the um, eyelidless lizard to see out but it stops the eyeball getting damaged and every time a snake sheds its skin it will shed this the brills as well with the skin so it's not just snakes that do this some lizards do it as well it has nothing to do with hypnosis that's poppycock I'll show you a picture a little later on of um, what this looks like on a, on a shed skin What is a snake? Snakes are legless reptiles closely related to lizards. They are covered with scales which may be rough or smooth. On the um, left hand on the left hand side there is a smooth scale death adder. The scales are beautifully smooth. If you were to rub your hand over them you would not feel any raises or anything like that. And I wouldn't recommend that because death adders bite. Next to it, in the middle, is a variegated bush adder. If you were to rub your hand over the scales of that snake, you'd feel they were rough, because every scale has a little ridge, like the keel on the underside of a boat, running down the centre of it. And you'll see this in arboreal snakes, you'll see it in aquatic snakes, quite a few snakes have keeled scales. It's desert snakes as well. Maybe it collects moisture. And then next to that, I've put a bit of an oddball, a Javan file snake. They don't have scales like any other snakes. There are three species of file snake in Southeast Asia, down to Australia, and they have tuberculate scales. They look, they're knobbly, and they've got little tiny bristles on the end, and they're thought to be sensory. These um, snakes hunt fish, and they can constrict the fish while they're trying to get the head into their mouths. It's very hard to hold a fish underwater if you've ever tried this. It slips straight out of your hand, because unlike snakes, they are slimy. But the grip of a file snake with these tuberculate scales, they not only may use them as a sensory means of finding prey, but they use them to grip the prey whilst they are getting the mouth over the fish's head. So they're a bit of an oddball. Most other snakes are either smooth scaled or they are rough scaled, in other words, keeled. Snakes have no eyelids, as I've told you, so they do not blink. Instead, they have a transparent covering over the eye called a spectacle or brill, which they shed when they shed their skin. Now, this is a piece of grass snake uh, skin that's been shed, and you're looking at it um, from the outside. When snakes shed their skins, they actually come off inside out, like taking a sock off, because they wear them, this skin away at the lips, split it, and then they come out of it. And it's just like peeling off a sock but this one has been cut and laid out so you can see it from the outside rather than from the inside which is what you'd be looking at if you looked at a fresh shed skin and you can see the two brills they've shed their contact lenses and they've got a new pair most diurnal day active snakes have round pupils most nocturnal night active snakes have cat like vertical pupils there's only one rule in nature, and that is there are no rules in nature, is always an exception to the rule. So, and I, I use the word most, because you will find exceptions. But here you can see the round pupil of a garter snake, which is most definitely a day active snake, and the vertical pupil of um, an inland, um, an island pit viper, which is from Timor, and you can see the vertical pupil. And what it, that's photographed in the daytime, and it's closed down. Now, when it's hunting at night that pupil will open up and it will look almost round because it's a much a very sensitive retina into the mid allowing more of the what available light into the retina there's always an exception and here's one most snakes can see movement but not shape or color but a few diurnal asian tree snakes have horizontal pupils and excellent vision this is the pupil of a long-nosed vine snake from Southeast Asia. Um, there, it's just the one genus and they have these horizontal pupils. They have two fovea in the retina that can focus and they have the long snouts which appear to almost have a groove down them and it's like sighting up down a rifle. And these snakes have 
excellent vision. They are able to locate extremely well camouflaged lizards and sneak up on them. And they are diurnally active. So not everything's got a round or vertically elliptical pupil. These have got a horizontal pupil. Why do snakes belonging to the same species sometimes look different? Well, there's two ways this can happen. One is sexual dimorphism. Di meaning two, morphism meaning shapes. And if you look at the long-nosed tree snakes, the Malagasy long-nosed tree snakes there from Madagascar, you'll see that the male at the top has a very long spike-like projection on the end of its snout, whereas the female has something that looks more like a flattened fur cone. This is sexual dimorphism because they are actually different shapes. They're also different colours. And that's what we see in the adder in the next photograph. The male and the female are different colours. Now they're not different shapes. So this is sexual dichromatism. Two chroma chromatism from colours, two colours. So that the males and the females are different colours. And this is quite common. Especially in vipers. And then we have something that's called an ontogenetic colour change. When the juvenile does not look the same as the adult. Now they don't change shape, but they do change colour. And here's a classic example of what we would call convergent or parallel evolution, where two snakes on opposite sides of the world, the green tree python in New Guinea and the emerald tree boa in South America in the Amazon, actually look very, very similar. And it usually takes an expert to tell one from the other. The python is on the, on the left of the screen. I don't, I don't know how you're looking at the screen, so I'm going to say left and right, I'm guessing. Um, and, and the boa is the one on the branch um, facing downwards. Now, look at the juveniles. Totally different colours. Juvenile, uh, ju juvenile green tree pythons can be yellow or they can be orange, sometimes they're green. But at about 15 to 18 months of age, the centre of every scale will get a green dot and when it sheds its skin it will be a green snake like the adult. And the emerald tree boa they often have orange, sometimes yellow, young, and they will go through the same ontogenetic colour change as they approach um, uh, sub-adulthood, as they grow up, they change colour. That's why sometimes snakes of the same species can look different. And of course, you have some snake species that are polymorphic, where a litter of young can all be different colours. And this isn't uncommon either. And sometimes people think that they're two different species because their pattern's completely different. But no. The garden tree bows of South America. I've walked down a trail catching them night after night in the Amazon and I've found up to five or six different colorations. They're all the same species. That's confusing. I've mentioned this. The primary sense used by snakes is their forked tongue. It picks up scent and transfers it to a special sense organ in the roof of the mouth called Jacobson's organ. This is how snakes find prey, track down a mate, and find their way around. And this is a brown tree snake flicking its forked tongue. And when they're interested in something, they will flick their tongue more often. Some snakes flick their tongue with a wide V. Some of the tree snakes that are seeking, that are very long and thin and don't want to be seen by lizards, when they flick their tongues out, they keep them virtually parallel, because that would be a giveaway. They keep them parallel and move them slowly. And some sea snakes, when they flick their tongues out, the forks are almost 180 degrees apart. So there's not one size fits all here. But a snake without its forked tongue is lost. Some snakes also have heat sensitive pits on their heads to help them find warm blooded prey. I.e. pit vipers such as rattlesnakes and boas and pythons. Here we have again something that's evolved several times in um, in snakes. The rattlesnake, you can see there, it's got one pit half, about a third of the way back from the nostril towards the eye and down. Whereas pythons and boas, they have pits all the way along their, both their upper and lower lips. So they have lots of pits. 
whereas the rattlesnakes and all their kin, um, Ferdilance and Bushmasters, all the pit vipers, they just have one pit on either side. But it works the same. And, it, and basically, it's transferring an infrared image to the brain of where a warm-blooded animal is. And the snake, even in a total darkness, can guarantee to hit that prey with 100% accuracy. I know, I've made the mistake of working with um, some of these snakes in dark places. And they can see me and I can't see them and I've paid the price. Right. The distribution of land snakes is illustrated here in red, including numerous island groups. Blue illustrates, this is light blue I mean, the dark blue is just the background. Light blue illustrates the distribution of marine snakes, the majority of it encompassing the range of the pelagic sea snake Hydrophis platorus. Hydrophis platorus is found from right down on the Cape and it actually has on occasion got round into onto the Namibian coast, but as a waif, they don't survive. Right the way from South Africa, from the Cape, all the way up through the Indian Ocean, right across to Australia, up to Japan, occasionally down to New Zealand, but again as a waif, it's not a population, it's one that's it's got swept along on the currents, then right across the Pacific, to California, down to Ecuador. That's a hell of a range. All the other sea snakes and the sea krites, which are slightly different, are found in the Indian and um, Western Pacific Ocean. But you see, snakes are found through much of the world. There are places with no snakes, of course. I'm sure you know them. Obviously, Greenland, Iceland, Ireland, and it's nothing to do with St. Patrick, New Zealand. There are a few places without snakes. I should have put that up before. Okay. So let's look at the geographical record breakers. The Adder. Top left. I hope it's top left for you. Top left. The Northern Adder. The Adder we find in the UK. This is the northernmost snake in the world. It occurs 100 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle in Norway, Sweden, Finland, and on the Kola Peninsula of Siberia. It's also the widest distributed, naturally occurring, this that's important, snake in the world. It's found all the way from Wales in the United Kingdom, right the way through Northern Europe, right the way through Central Asia, all the way to Far East Asia, and onto Sakhalin Island, which is an, a Russian island located to the north of Japan. That's the widest ranging, widest occurring land snake, terrestrial snake. Its compatriot, the southernmost snake in the world, is the Patagonian lancehead, which is on the opposite side, so for me it's top right. That snake occurs right down into, almost not quite to Tierra del Fuego in, 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 um, in South America, but certainly into Patagonian um, Argentina. It's not on the other side of the Andes in Chile, but I've, I went to look for this specimen, this species, and found three on Peninsula Valdez. If you look at a map of um, South America, Peninsula Valdez is a peninsula that looks like a mushroom sticking out on the side of Argentina, and I found them there, and they go further south than that. The highest distributed snake in the world is the Himalayan pit viper in the center of the screen, and that's been recorded in the Himalayas, obviously, up to 4,900 meters. And there are several other species, a like pit viper and some, and some hot spring snakes, that are about a thousand meters lower. But that, at the moment, is the record holder for the highest snake in the world. The most widely distributed marine snake you've already been introduced to on the map that is the pelagic sea snake Hydrophis platorus, which, as I've told you, is found all the way from the Cape, right the way through Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, to the west coast of California and down to Ecuador. Now, the widest distributed introduced snake is the one in the bottom right, and that's a Brahmini blind snake. It's a little snake, it could curl up in your hand. 
It lives in the root balls of plants, which is why it gets transported all around the world with tropical plants, with crops and things like that. And the most interesting thing about this tiny, I mean, let's face it, for most, but it, it's, it's the same colour as the inside of a biro, about as thick as the inside of a biro, uh, nearly as long as the inside of a biro, and for most people about as interesting as the inside of a biro. But it is interesting because it is the only natural occurring pathogenetic snake, what we call an obligate pathogenetic snake. There are a number of lizards, but this is the only snake. And if you want to know what that means, well, it's virgin birth. A female can start a new colony without needing a male, which is just as well, because there aren't any. The entire species is female. And if somebody orders some plants from one part of the world, they are shipped with a root ball of soil to another place, and then they're planted, and these little snakes, if they're there, they get out, and if the conditions are conducive, they start a new colony. She doesn't need to mate. This makes her a fantastic colonist. So she is interesting after all. And that picture is about 20 times bigger than the snake. Let's look at the other record breakers, the largest and smallest. Okay, the largest snake that we think ever lived is probably Titanoboa. Titanoboa serigioensis. Now I've had to use a picture of a boa constrictor because um, there wasn't a suitable artwork of Titanoboa, but um, I've scaled it there. This, this snake was around in the late Paleocene, 60 to 58 million years ago, and it grew to about 12.8 meters in length. The largest, longest living snake is the reticulated python, Malayo python reticulatus, and that can achieve 10 meters. Those specimens of that size are rarely seen these days, and they tend to get killed if they are, but that's the longest living snake in the world. And there is some question about whether that um, record length is accurate, and you might have to shave one meter off, but still, it's impressive. The heaviest snake in the world often quoted as the longest, incorrectly, is the green anaconda, Eunectis marinus, which females may achieve 8 metres. Males are much, much smaller. And it's the heaviest snake in the world, up to um, 100 kilograms. Um, I've, the, long, the heaviest one I've caught was 73 kilograms in Venezuela in 1997, I think. Um, and that snake was about 18 feet long, so that would be about just under 6 meters, so big snake. The longest venomous snake in the world is the King Cobra. Um, they used to, the, the length quoted used to be 18 and a half feet. Um, that record is now in a little bit of doubt. Um, we can safely say that males can achieve five meters, females a lot shorter. The, I've got the heaviest living venomous snake. That should say the longest living venomous snake. My apologies, because the heaviest would be puff adder or a gaboon viper or a bushmaster or something like that. No way an elapid is going to be in that league. So don't read heaviest, read longest. I will have to correct that if I use this presentation again. The smallest snake in the world, the Barbados thread snake, Trachychiostoma carle. Its name is longer than it is. It is 10 centimeters long, and that is a photo of it sitting on an American quarter dollar, which doesn't mean a damn thing to anybody in the UK because we don't know what they look like size wise. Right. Where are snakes found? The diversity of snake habitats. Well, pretty much anywhere except very cold places. In tropical regions, you'll get things like flying snakes, perfectly adapted for life in the trees. Fresh water, you'll get um, Erpeton tentacularum, the, the, the tentacle snake, which 
hunts its prey using these amazing tentacles on the, on the front of its snout. In arid regions, things like the Serastes, the, the Saharan horn vipers, which can shuffle down into the sand and sidewind across it, but I'll come to that. There's even a few snakes in, in uh, temperate regions in Europe and North America. I mean, the Montpellier snake is a classic, fast-moving example that you see in Europe crossing roads. Puff adders in savannas. The golden lancehead on islands. This is an island off um, Brazil, Ilha Comada Grande. It has got 5,000 um, golden lanceheads on there. And they are the most venomous snake in the Americas because they have to kill birds. They're not doing the regular strike and release bite on mammals because there aren't any. So it's, it's had to adapt very toxic venom. Um, perianthropic, that means human mediated, human made um, um, habitats. I could include cities there, but I've used plantations and a Papuan Taipan because we've caught lots of Papuan Taipan in plantations, more in the plantations than we find in the wild, in nature, in natural pristine habitats. You could say this is nature's payback. When man turns over a big area to a monoculture, which isn't good for the environment, the one snake that does really well in there is often a highly venomous snake. Um, alpine, boreal or austral, that, that means up, up mountains, up towards the north and down towards the south. Well, here I've included um, the hot spring snake, um, which is found right up on the Tibetan plateau. And they're only found close to these warm springs. They can't move far away because the conditions are not conducive to existence. And caves and subterranean. Well, a classic example is the cave racer, which lives in, cage, in caves and catches bats. And I could have added other habitats. I could have put in the sea snakes, of course, as marine. There are, there are plenty of other habitats that I could have added in there. So snakes are found in a lot of different habitats. So how do they move around? Okay, I'm hoping this is going to work, because sometimes it doesn't. The most obvious method is serpentine motion. Classic snake locomotion. And that works both on land and in the water with this grass snake. And then we have, for slightly heavier snakes, concertina motion, Pull, pulling part of the body forwards, drawing the body up behind. It looks slow, it is. It looks clumsy, it is. This is how a heavy-bodied snake will move. But there's also this method used by the puff adder. Oh, no, we're not getting that, we're getting the sidewinder. Okay, this is how a snake moves over loose shifting sand, sidewinding, leaving J-shaped marks in the sand. It keeps a lot of its body off the hot sand, and if you've ever tried to run up a sand dune, it's not easy. And this is how the snake can do it. It travels diagonally from one clump of grass to another clump of grass by basically stepping over it and leaving these J-shaped marks, sidewinding. And there, there are sidewinding vipers um, in, in the Namib, in uh, southern Africa, in Namibia, um, in in the Sahara, in Arabia, in, in, on the Pakistan-Afghan border, and of course there's sidewinding rattlesnakes in southwestern USA. So this means of locomotion has evolved several times independently in different snakes. <coughs> and the one I wanted to show you, let's see if it works, there we go, a puff adder, a heavy-bodied snake, drawing itself along. Your ribs are attached to your sternum, your breastbone at the front, so you don't have much movement in them. The snakes don't have a sternum, so those ribs are free-ended. The muscles between them, the intercostal muscles, are very strong, so they can draw them forward like that. And you can see it almost appears to be walking on the ends of its ribs. It's drawing the body along, almost in a dead straight line. And this is another method, like concertina, that's used by heavy-bodied snakes that can't be throwing coils out all over the place. What about movement in trees? Watch this scrub python. That's a straight trunk with no purchases. No problem. Up it goes. 
using the strength of its constricting coils to grip the trunk. And here's another method. In a rat snake, <coughs> its body is arch shaped in cross section. So there's a little corner all the way down the body, a ridge. And what it does is it pushes that into any blemishes into the bark and gets a grip. A bit like a climber, a free climber, going up a rock face using their fingertips in the smallest of gaps. It's just pushing the edges of the scales into the bark. Okay, now we're going to look at what snakes eat. There are no herbivorous vegetarian snakes. But there are numerous specialists and generalists invertebrate feeders. The Brahmini blind snake eats ants and termites. The common slug eater, as the name suggests, uh, eats slugs and snails. And the, the, some of these slug eating snakes, they've got two clever tricks. Firstly, when they're going to eat a snail, it's hiding in its shell. But they can, because the snake's lower jaw is in two separate halves, I didn't cover that, it's not like ours, fused at the front. Snake's lower jaw is two separate halves, so it can expand like that when it's swelling prey, it can do that to draw the prey down the throat. That's also useful here because it can extend one half of the lower jaw inside the shell with the long teeth at the front, grip the snail and pull it out of its shell. And the other problem that slug and snail eaters have to deal with is the slime. Herpetologists refer to these snakes as the goo eaters. They are eating very slimy creatures. And um, they actually have oral mouth glands that secrete uh, substances that defeat the slime of the slug or the snail. Otherwise they just get their mouths glued up and they're able to eat this prey without the problems that we would have if we tried to do it. Um, earthworms. The, the snakes I work on from New Guinea, Toxica calamus, um, it's a venomous group but they all eat earthworms and in New Guinea and Australia and, and New Zealand there are a group of giant earthworms called the Megascolosids which would look good on uh, Beetlejuice or June um, and these, these snakes eat them. And this, this um, museum specimen I photographed had eaten an earthworm longer than itself. It's still protruding from its mouth. Again, they have to deal with the um, secretions of the earthworms, which they are able to do. Um, Hemprich's coral snake, it eats velvet worms. What are those? Well, they're peripatus. They are amazing creatures. You should look them up. They're one of the most interesting invertebrates. They, they look like a caterpillar with big antennae, and they're a very unusual group. And I've only, I've only seen three or four specimens in all my traveling in the tropics. So if I was a, a Hemprich's coral snake, I'd get very hungry, because I don't find them very often. But he does, obviously. Um, the copperhead, well, copperheads obviously eat um, a lot of mammals and reptiles, but this one is eating a katydid. Uh, Sword scale vipers, some of them take lizards, um, some take small mammals, but they also eat scorpions. And they have the ones that feed on scorpions have got specially adapted venom to kill scorpions. Centipede eating snake in the bottom left, um, they only eat uh, scolopendrid centipedes. These are these really big, highly venomous ones, and it's obviously immune to the bite of the centipede. Um, in, the, in the bottom centre we have a queen snake eating a crayfish, which is uh, like a, a freshwater lobster if you like. And then a white-bellied mangrove snake which eats crabs and mud lobsters. Now, it eats freshly molted crabs. Crabs when they've got hard shells are a bit difficult, but when they molt they're soft for a while. And that's when the, um, the mangrove snake eats them, it catches them, and then it shakes them like a terrier until all the legs fall off. and then it eats the main part of the crab. So there's a great diversity in, um, in invertebrate feeders. Fish. Many, many snakes eat fish. The file snake, that I showed you the photograph earlier of the, what the file snake skin looks like. That's a whole uh, Javan file snake, very knobbly. And as I told you, it grips hold of the fish in its coils, in the water, 
<coughs> works its head to the its mouth to the head end and swallows it that way. And then they even eat big catfish. The tentacle snake with its tentacles on the snout from Thailand, very unique. I've kept these and they stay motionless in the water, in the reeds, totally motionless, just waiting till a fish swims too close. The tentacles must tell it, they must be sensory, and it simply grabs the fish quickly, kills it with a mildly venomous bite, and eats it. It's all over really quickly. Uh, the banded water cobras, they eat cichlids in, um, in the lakes and uh, the rivers of Central Africa. I went to look for the Lake Tanganyika um, uh, water cobra, didn't find it, um, but they're, they're fish specialists. They are doing in, in rivers and lakes in Central Africa what the sea snakes do in the ocean, dropping straight, uh, dropping down to the beaked, southern beak sea snake, which you can see under the file snake. This is one of the most highly venomous snakes in the world. They really are aggressive. They really bite. They, they live in a candy floss world. They live in a world of mangrove mud and they never reach, meet a hard surface. Um, they never meet a straight line. And, and so they are very vulnerable to anything like that. And when we were catching these, if you wanted to milk them to get their venom, as soon as you touched them, their heads would start to swell up. They are so, so easily damaged. But they feed on catfish and shrimp in this mangrove mud world in um, northern Australia and, and up through New Guinea in the river estuaries and uh, where the water is so turbid, so muddy you can't see and they are all hunting by touch. The pelagic sea snake, which I showed you earlier again, the black and yellow snake, this is the big oceanic wanderer and it's pelagic, that means at the surface of the ocean. If it was benthic it would mean it was at the bottom of the ocean and it's swimming at the surface and little fish are seeking shade and where you have currents meet you get flotsam and jetsam floating on the surface and these snakes will get in there and the little fish come in for the shade from the sun under the flotsam and jetsam and under the snakes and he just reaches down and catches his lunch like that and sometimes there are drifts of thousands of yellow bellied or pelagic sea snakes just floating on the ocean with all the little fish underneath them so dinner comes to them and one of the most interesting is the turtle-headed sea snake, which is a snake, a, a snake that does not feed on fish at all. It eats fish eggs. It's called the turtle-headed sea snake because I've shaded in on the picture of the, yellow, the orange. They have all those scales along the lip fused into one scale. And they use them for scraping fish eggs off the coral. And that's all they eat so they don't need venom. Their fangs are really short, their venom is very small yield and very weak and if you'd like to come back in a hundred thousand years they may actually have become non-venomous. Amphibians. A lot of snakes eat amphibians. The Santa Cruz garter snake eats newts and frogs it sequesters the toxins from its prey. Sequester means reutilize and use, move somewhere else. If you look across at the, tig the tiger keelback, that also eats poisonous toads and sequesters their toxins. And it advertises this fact by having um, red on the back of its neck to warn you that it is poisonous. Now you'll say, no, 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 snakes are venomous. Yeah, a bite from a snake is venomous. But some of these snakes, actually, like the keel back there, are poisonous to eat. It's different. They are dangerous in two ways. Because they sequester, they reutilize the toxins from their prey. In the center is a red-tailed coral snake that eats the salians, which I mentioned very early on, the long, legless, worm-like um, amphibians. Below that is a ring-neck snake which eats newts and salamanders in North America. To the uh, left is a, a cat-eyed snake in South America eating not just frogs but um, frogs' eggs. And I watched this one come down at night and just feed on the tree frogs' eggs. Um, and then in the bottom right, a mud snake from Florida. And that eats sirens. And these are another strange group of amphibians. They, they, they're dark, like salamanders, but they've only got front legs, no back legs, they're rather weird, and um, the mud snake eats them. 
reptiles. The long-nosed vine snake. I told you about how good these snakes were at sighting up down these horizontal pupils, looking down the snouts and finding camouflaged lizards. And here in the top left is under, under reptiles is a long-nosed vine snake hunting in that way. The long pointy head. In the middle, top, green anaconda. Now this was one I found in Venezuela in a lagoon. And I thought it looked thin. Because I found it a week before this. I thought it looked thin and there didn't appear to be any food. So I thought I'd maybe relocate it to somewhere where it would find prey. And I went back some days later and um, I didn't need to bother. It was fat. It had eaten a caiman. Now this anaconda was about 12 feet long and it had eaten a, a caiman of between 3 and 4 feet long. I could feel the caiman's head and its body and its legs by just palpating the snake. So it was fine. Um, next to that is um, a cape cobra, a lapids cobra is their big, their big snake eaters. He's eating a puff adder. So venomous snakes do get eaten. Um, below that is a common file snake. Now no relation to the Asian file snakes I showed you with the tuberculate skin. This is the unfortunate thing about common names. They get applied to lots of different species. This is not related. This is a totally different file snake. These are in, in Africa. And this is the one from um, Southern Africa. Well, it's found throughout a lot of Africa actually. And it's, it's called a file snake because it's sort of the shape of a file in your father's garage. And it's rough. Now that eats, specializes in eating other snakes, including venomous snakes. And it will even eat the Cape Cobra if it gets the opportunity. Next there's a King Cobra killing and eating a reticulated python. The king cobra's genus is Ophiophagus. Ophio is snake, phagus is oesophagus, swallower, the snake swallower. And um, king cobras will even eat other king cobras. And then next to that um, is a, a painted coral snake which eats amphisbenians, which I mentioned briefly, and they are um, worm lizards. They are um, a branch that's come out of the lizards that's, that's almost totally limbless except for spe three species in Mexico which have front legs but no hind legs called bipes or adulate. Birds. A lot of snakes can climb so a lot of snakes will eat birds. The brown tree snake, top left, accidentally introduced to Guam after World War II when the Americans were shipping tanks and trucks back to continental USA and storing them on Guam. Um, it established itself. There are no predators, plenty of prey. That species has eaten seven flightless bird species into extinction. Because if you're an island bird and you've got no predators, why, why fly when you can walk? Because you get up, swept out to sea by the wind or something, you're in problems. So a lot of flightless birds live on islands, which is their downfall. Because when a predator, like a voracious predator, like the brown tree snake, arrives, they've got no defences. And it's eaten seven species into extinction. Three more are in protected custody. The, the fruit bat is in danger, all because of this one introduced snake. And they reckon now there's a million brown tree snakes on Guam. I went there, I caught them all along the the um, Air Force Base fencing. In the middle top is a puffing snake. These are also bird specialists from South America. And then top right, the boom slang from um, tropical Africa. Now this is a specialist on, it eats, cha it eats chameleons, but it also eats birds. And that is a weaver bird nest. And the weaver birds build these long nests that hang down the hole at the bottom so they can fly in but predators hopefully can't get in. Boomslang can, can climb down, go in and eat the chicks and the eggs. Underneath that Santa Catalina Island rattlesnake on one small island in the Sea of Cortez between Baja California and mainland Mexico. This rattlesnake has no rattle, it never develops one. The reason is it doesn't want to give the game away. It feeds on birds it hunts them at night through the creosote bushes, looking for them with its heat sensitive pits. And the last thing it needs is a rattle, which would be like a bell on a cat's, around a cat's neck. It would give the game away and the birds would fly. So it has no rattle. 
On the far side is the Golden Lancet, which I told you about, on Ilya Kimada Grande of Brazil. Again, a specialist with highly venomous, uh, highly toxic venom and extra long fangs to feed on birds because there are no mammals on the island and its, its relatives on the mainland feed on mammals. They strike the prey from ambush, sit back, wait for it to run away, die, then they track it down using the forked tongue. But this snake can't do that because if it hits a bird, the bird goes do 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 do, drops six foot away. Can't track that because the bird hasn't gone along the ground. So they have to hang on to the prey and kill it so they have extra toxic venom. And then, of course, the famous egg eating snake. There are a bunch of them in Africa and there's one in Asia. And what they do is they'll get, they know if it's a fresh egg, they won't eat bad eggs. And they will maneuver the mouth over the egg. It goes um, into the start of the throat. It gets burst on spines in the, in the, of, of the uh, vertebrae. All the good part of the egg goes down the snake's throat and it coughs out the shell. And that is what you get. Coughs out this shell, which is the remains of the, the, the bird's egg. Mammals. Okay. Eastern rat snake there eating a squirrel. On the far side, a prairie rattlesnake also eating a squirrel. Below that, a puff adder eating a mouse. A Mexican night snake eating a bat the same way that the cave racers would. This is in Mexico. Cave racers are in Southeast Asia. The one I showed you was from Borneo. They're all pretty regular fare, but then we get to the big feeders. At the top we've got an African rock python, which is just about to finish swallowing an antelope. This takes a long time. And a photo of a large reticulated python, which has also seemingly eaten a deer. When these pictures appear on the internet, they invariably say it has eaten a human. Usually it hasn't. I say usually because there have been cases. Um, there is, there's a tribe in um, the Philippines, the actor, who, who hunt these pythons for food, but the pythons also hunt them, and people do get taken. And there have been certainly cases of people eaten by reticulated pythons and both of the African rock pythons. But no cases, as far as we're aware of it, of an anaconda ever eating anybody, even though it's probably capable. But those are extremely rare, and people eat a lot more snakes than snakes eat people. But they have this amazing capacity and if you look at the, the reticulated python at the bottom you'll see the lower jaw is well spread apart. The bone of the two heart of the lower jaw you can see where those are pointing out um, stiffly and then in between it's just skin. So because they do not dislocate their jaws. Snakes articulate their lower jaw. They are not popping it out from the skull I've dislocated my right shoulder four times. It hurts a lot. It does not improve my appetite. It makes me quite sick, actually. So I wouldn't, they do not dislocate something. How would they put it back? They articulate it. There's just no bone in the front of the chin. So the two halves, like, that's your lower jaw. That's the snake's lower jaw. And that's how they can eat big meals and draw it down the throat and get the lower jaw in to pull a snail out of a shell. Pretty remarkable. These snakes have been around for 65 million years. They've learned a trick or two. Next will be part two.